they H. pylori is a bacterial infection in your gut, but notoriously, it just comes back over and over and over again. And people go on rounds and rounds of multiple antibiotics to get rid of it. And for me, it's it, what what's interesting about it is is that even though you're taking anytime any someone takes an antibiotic, they're killing not just the good back the the target bacteria, which is H. pylori, but you're also killing a bunch of good bacteria as well. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome today. Uh, I'm Maggie UMD. I'm a functional and holistic medicine physician and I'm an owner of Transform. And uh, if you haven't joined our Facebook group already, join our Facebook group, which is Transform Autoimmune Disease Naturally. Today's big topic is what is real Manuka honey? And we have some serious people in the house today. We got Paul and Cheryl Steens from Steens Manuka Honey, all the way from New Zealand. Welcome, New Zealand. Thank you. Yeah, thank thank you. you for having us. It's great. My big thing as a, as a functional MD is I think that um, we really need an educational format to actually teach people about their health or things that they can do for their health. Uh, there's a lot of marketing and then there's real education. And so today we're going to do some real education and I'm going to bust some serious myths around Manuka honey. Uh, I consider Manuka honey a serious biohack, but at the same time, when people in this country or around the world, uh, when they see something labeled Manuka honey, there's a lot of actually fact versus fiction, uh, label versus real results. So first of all, I'd love for you guys just to introduce yourselves, the two of you, uh, co-founders of Steens, and tell me a little bit about your background, and um, and then we're going to jump into what is real Manuka honey. Paul, Cheryl, please introduce yourselves. I'd love to hear a little more about your background here. Right. Well, Paul and I have been beekeeping for, we started beekeeping maybe nearly 40 years ago. Yeah, yeah. And we, I was teaching. And Paul was butchering, and we were looking at doing, um, we're looking at, at alternative things to do. And at one stage, we thought about being lighthouse keepers, but then they automated all the lighthouses. And then we thought about being goat farmers. <laughs> and Paul built, Paul built me a little milking shed, and and I had a little goat that I used to milk and make cheese. And so we were kind of really a sort of sustainable, kind of you know. They used to call us the good life. Yeah, the carob hippies, kind of. You know, kind of, we were we were those kind of people, and always looking at, at at living off the land and being sustainable. And so we ended up. Well, Paul did a, a course on beekeeping, and he bought three beehives on a Saturday morning, and we just absolutely fell in love with them. And we had no idea on that day that that was going to sort of path the course, path the way for the rest of our lives. So yeah, so it's been it's been a great great journey, and I carried on teaching. So we could eat. Paul gave up his day job, and <laughs> we um, yeah, and it's just been we've been honeying ever since. And and I guess you know we got to this point because it was it, we used to sell all our honey bulk sort of and sell it off, and people would put it in pots and sell it themselves and put it in their own brand. Yeah. But we we went on a trip to the UK and we saw the honey that we had sold to to people, and they'd put it in a pot. And we couldn't believe what had happened to it. It wasn't the honey that we ate. It wasn't the honey that I fed my family. It was heated and it had been bastardized, so to speak. So we came home and thought we can so do this differently. We can so do this yeah. better. And we can put this beautiful honey that we produce into a pot so that you and all the consumers all over the world can, you know, share around our kitchen table, so to speak, and have the same have the same feeling and the same goodness that we get rather than it all being burnt off and think, anyway, I've talked enough, it's full stern. I think you covered it. That was really good. You guys are the real experts. So you're the real deal. And I want to just ask right out of the gate the first question. What I want to ask is, what is Manuka honey? What's different than that than regular honey? The biggest difference is that Peter Molan discovered um, way back 40, 45 years ago that it has a activity in it that's unique. And we didn't know what it was at the time. And so they called it the unique Manuka factor. And that's where the UMF label comes from. And then that organization promoted it and, and did all the research and the science behind it. Um, but coming back to the difference is just this unique activity that isn't destroyed by heat. Okay. Now, when we say the questions, that was one of the questions. So, yeah. it has unique medicinal properties that is not destroyed by heat. 
Yeah, but but that's within obviously parameters. I mean, it 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 isn't um, it isn't destroyed as easily as non peroxide activity, which is your um, activity that most honeys have when it's still in the beehive. Once it goes out of the beehive and is processed using heat, the um, what we call peroxide activity in the honey is destroyed. Okay, so in a good manuka honey, we need to have keep the peroxide activity and the non-peroxide activity, which is the manuka factor. Well, let's talk about that, but to even have the name manuka, is it a specific strain of bees? Is it a specific type of plant is on? Um, is is that a part of that designation? Okay, so yes, your manuka plant is, is a, um, what we call here a shrub. Um, shrub. A shrubby, shrubby tree, it's not a big, big tree, but yeah. Um, and it is a, there is a number of different types of manukas um, within that group. So that's where the bees collect this manuka from. And we'll come on to that later, but the more of that they collect, the more pure the format is, which okay. leads on to your grading system. Can honey be labeled manuka if it's not even from this plant? We're no. talking and I guess, I guess coming coming back to that, that's exactly what was happening in the very beginning of the industry because manuka honey is a, a pretty new phenomenon, really, as far as you know, putting it in a pot and, and consumers having it and people having it. So, I guess in the, in the early days, anything that was brown honey was put into a pot and sold as manuka, which is kind of what what you're alluding to there. Yeah, I'm alluding to yes. Yeah. So that's why, you know, Peter Mullen came in and the industry um, had to clean up his act because, you know, consumers were being draped everywhere. So so if we get, if we just take that a bit further and we start looking at the actual manuka content, if you like, of a particular honey. So if we're talking about real manuka, to our way of understanding this, real manuka, or it's, it comes back to degrees. So obviously when the bees are out foraging, um, if there's not a massive stand of just manuka, they're going to be collecting other honeys as well. And we can test for that. We test for that using, under the UMF Association, they have their own standard, which is a little bit higher, if you like, or adds more parameters to the MGO standard, which the MGO standard is purely measuring just one chemical component in the honey. Whereas the UMF Association works more about the whole honey. We now know what is the definition of a manuka honey. But the second thing is then, okay, how do we know the manuka honey that we're buying has those real antimicrobial activities? When the work was first done by Peter Molan, um, unless the honey was at least a 10 plus, what we call a 10 plus, and I'll get onto that, um, it wasn't didn't have it wasn't rated as having enough activity to really be of significant benefit. So MGO starts from a very low rating and goes all the way up to a high rating. MGO, UMF, that's MGO. MGO. Yes. And what does yes. the word MGO stand for? Methyl yeah. methyl glow oxal. Exactly. That's, that's the actual the actual chemical that is antimicrobial. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Yes. So the manuka honey to work at its purity rating, it has a rating, and the higher the rating, the more pure the manuka content of the honey is. Yeah. So obviously, if you have a very low rating, it could have eighty percent other honeys in it. So the manuka content in that honey is very low, and from a um, pure medis medical point of view. It yeah. will have a very low efficacy. Efficacy. And I agree with that. So what you're saying is, is that they're testing for the amount of the actual antimicrobial su substance in MGO rating. And then UMF is unit of the mic microbial activity of the... No, the UMF, all the, the UMF, um, yes, it's, it's measuring, it's, it has other parameters which measure more than just the MGO. So it's a more complete test. Okay. Yeah. And it also, it, for, I think for the consumer, it's also very easy to, to understand, unless it has a UMF rating of 10 or above, or an MGO rating of 10 or above. So, sorry, what's the equivalent of an MGO? Uh, equivalent of 263 MGO or above, then I think you'd get very little medical benefit from it. It would still be a healthy honey. Yep. And the other thing that mm. the UMF tests for is a leptospirum. 
which MGO doesn't test for. So that's an extra marker they look forward to for genuine Manuka honey. So what that means to me is, is that the higher the number, whether it's MGO or UMF, the higher the antimicrobial activity and efficacy of it. Yes. And that's also higher the concentration uh, uh, and uh, of the Manuka that's in that. Pure yeah. Yeah. It's the purer uh, um, Manuka that you get, the higher the numbers. That's why there's also a price difference, the higher the UMF that you go. But the cool thing is there is a standardization that measures the actual efficacy um, and how much that particular Manuka is effective or purity of it in a way it reflective in that number. Right. So shopping for higher numbers, if that's what you're looking for, is going to be important, depending on what you're what you're trying to use it for. Just because something's labeled Manuka, just because something's labeled with higher UMF, um, does that mean, does that tell you anything about how that honey is processed and does processing in the way that it's processed affect the efficacy as well? Absolutely. Big time. Yeah. The more you heat something, the more the, the flavonoids, more all those things are going to be cooked off and all the, it's exactly the same with honey. So the less processing, the better the honey is. So, you know, we've always, and I guess that comes back to that, that, whole, that trip that we made to the UK and decided, you know, how we could do this better. And one of the big things was, and Paul was very clever, and him and another beekeeper that he was working with developed a processing method that where we didn't have to do all the secondary processing and all this heating. And so we could just honestly pretty much take that honey out of the beehive, not fine filter because we don't want to keep, we still want to keep all the other things in it. And we we can put it in a pot. And so it truly is raw. And I think where it's I love really, that. sorry. And I love and that it, you know, it's raw manuka honey it's and it's true. truly raw without any heat process. Yes. And I think that's what's so disheartening in a sense for us also, because, you know, when you've got a product, whatever it is, you're also in marketing. So, you know, and, and lots, so lots of market, lots of beekeeping companies have also, and I'm not bagging anybody because that's not my game or our game, we wouldn't do that. But, you know, they use words that aren't exactly true. And the, so they use the word raw as a terminology for, as a terminology kind of for natural or, you know, where we know that that honey has been treated and has, it's not uh, So it's like know, the word natural. Yes, and there's no standard for raw. You know, we, you can't, we don't, there's no standard of what is actually raw honey. That is a huge point because that's for me, like when someone says something is natural, high fructose corn syrup can be natural, <laughs> you know, yeah. so that word could be meaningless. And so it's really important yeah. to question what that really means. And even if something is labeled raw Manuka honey, it doesn't mean it's actually raw in the sense that it was never heat processed. No, yeah. that's right. Correct. Yeah. Because there's yeah. no regulation around the use of that term. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Am I right? Yeah, okay. absolutely. And one of the problems why they like to um, secondary process the honey is because they can standardise it. It's a lot easier to do. There's less issues involved. When you when you try and do a raw honey like we do, there are a lot of issues attached to that around shelf life, fermentation, all these other issues that we had to overcome. So it's it's and there's no standardisation. So every pot's different. Um, whereas the old way of thinking was let's try and get all our honey the same, so the customer has the same experience every time. Whereas if you eat our honey, you'll get a different experience with every pot because every pot comes from a different batch. Yep. It's going to have a different amount of crystal. It's going to have a different flavor. It's still delicious. But we're, still interested, good we're interested in getting the nutrition mm -hmm. to you, not the color, mm -hmm. the flavor, mm -hmm. those other things. Mm -hmm. They all are a buy and buy. So if you look, you know, I don't know if you can see it, but this little pot here, so you can see some a bit of layering, a bit of changes and things. That's happy days. It, it, and, but a consumer who is used to having the same product looking exactly the same might look at that and think, oh, jeepers, that's, you know, a bit, that's, you know, kind of not right. Well, it's, it's wonderfully right. Yeah. I love that. Okay. So my other thing is I had no idea you New Zealanders got the corner in quality Manuka. What's so different about Manuka out of New Zealand that's labeled out of New Zealand? Yes. Yeah. It's a um, unique word to New Zealand. Um, and it's the Maori word for the um, particular type of plant. Well, I had no idea that New Zealand actually has the strictest standard for what is called manuka honey versus manuka honey that's from, let's say, Australia or other countries. There's actually really strict laws around what can be, if something's out in New Zealand and it's called manuka honey, you know there's 10,000 things that criteria that I had to go through. Am I correct on that or no? Yes, yeah, and right. as long as it's packed in New Zealand. 
So it's got to be packed in New Zealand because those laws don't don't translate to other countries. So yeah. we have those we have those standards and those laws for I've got to get this camera around the right way. I keep going over here and then realise I'm disappearing off the off, <laughs> off the page. Cheryl, you're doing the cutest thing you're doing this thing. You're like, you should be pulling a van of white on this. <laughs> uh, yeah. there's a yeah. u.s show where uh i think it was the price is right where they're like the banner white would hold up the products and she'd do this kind of thing with it yeah so you're pulling a banner out white i don't know if you can see the spots <laughs> <laughs> all right i digress all right let's do some questions. I want to talk about, first of all, let's, I want to talk about what I know are medical benefits. I, why I recommend it, how I use it. I'd love people in the audience to talk about what their experience has been with Manuka. Uh, if you personally have used that, uh, um, I would love to ha hear how you use it and what kind of health benefits you've had in the comment section. That'd be great. I know a couple things from a medical doctor standpoint, I'm a functional medicine doctor. So what I do is I really specialize at looking at all the natural tools that work. And especially it's also data, data is supported as well. So absolutely there, um, you can put Manuka honey straight on any sort of wound, uh, even acne on your skin. You can use it as a mask, how I recommend it to my clients um, with acne, or if you have any sort of skin issues like eczema or um, psoriasis, um, what you can do, lichen, lichen planus, lichen sclerosis, is you put the honey on wherever it is. Um, as a mask, I have people put it on, leave it on for about 10, 15 minutes right before they shower, and then just shower. And when they shower, they don't use soap. Just go ahead and rinse it right off. There's a little bit of abrasive quality for it, which is like gives you a little microdermatization. Basically, microdermatization. You use it to scrub it a little bit, and so it's a mask. You can use it as a mask. And if you're going to use it as a mask, me personally, I would use something that's UMF 20 or higher. Um, for me, so that you have optimal antimicrobial activities right on the skin. Um, well, that's one way to use it is on a wound or on your face as a mask. Do you guys have, how do you guys use it personally topically, like on the skin? Well, you, all the time. It's our first point of, if ever we amazing on burns, just like you can almost see the skin starting to, within days, starting to, to close up and heal. And and I think, you know, there's just a lovely little story that the grandchildren, uh, they just live up the road on the farm. And every time they cut themselves or graze themselves or skin their knees or whatever, they come straight and nanny Opa, where's the I need honey? So it's just you would know, plaster the honey on, stick a band-aid on, and and happy days. So it's just, you know, it it's it's, uh, I, I guess that's the paradigm shift, the shift in our thinking. We we don't kind of think of putting honey on our on our skin. We think of ingesting it because that's kind of what we've always done. But there's an, an enormous amount of research out there that's been done on the efficacy of manuka honey and wound healing. And the other thing too about using it on your face, because honey's a natural, hum I never know if it's a humectant or a humicant. It's a humectant. So it absorbs moisture and retains the moisture. So, you yep. know, after you've had a, a lovely um, facial with it, I often, yep. you know, the, I'd, I'd look around with the kids and I'd see them all sitting there watching TV with their faces plastered in honey. And, you know, and, and so putting it on when you, when you, you know, got nothing to do, just sitting there watching telly for, keep it on for whatever, a minimum of 10 minutes. And then, like you say, just wash it off and it, and it leaves your skin feeling so moist and so beautiful. So if you heat Manuka honey, do you basically lose all the benefits of it? Uh, let's dispel, let's answer that question first. Yeah. Well, as Paul said before, um, it's the antibacterial activity in Manuka honey is heat stable. Well, you wouldn't you wouldn't go boiling it and turning it into, into sugar. Whatever right. you, you, I think, you know, common sense prevails. And, and it's like it was, if I'm making a tea, or Paul, Paul wants a, a nice tea and he wants some honey in it. I don't I don't pour the boiling water over the over the tea bag or the pot of tea and then put the honey straight in. I'll let it cool. So one of the things I do in the morning that I really love is warm water. Okay. I you know, a lot of people in this country don't drink warm water, but Asia, um, that's how I grew up is we drank warm water more than we did cold water. So what I would do is I would take the warm water. And I would put in a squeeze of organic lemon juice. I would put in a teaspoon of the manuka honey. Um, and if I'm having, if I want to have more fun with it, I'll throw in some ginger if I want to. Um, but that to me is a really great way. First thing in the morning is you actually, the manuka honey is very soothing and highly absorbable for the gut. And there's a lot of like, um, 
anecdotal evidence of people with like irritable bowel syndrome, kids who have a lot of tummy aches. And when you actually do a little bit of Manuka honey and drink it, um, it actually is really gut soothing. Okay, so it's it's part of a gut healing protocol. And Manuka is also a probiotic. What probiotic means, there's a difference between probiotic and a, a prebiotic. Prebiotic is something that feeds the healthy bacteria in your gut. Carrying on with the gut health medium, you, you obviously be very familiar with H. pylori. Yes. Yes. Now, um, unbeknown to me that I, when I was um, first getting into beekeeping and doing a lot of, um, I suppose, a lot of stress, and um, went in to see the specialist about stomach complaints. And he went and had a look and he said, Paul, you're very full of H. pylori. Um, so he said, we're going to come back in three months' time, and if it's still bad, we're going to have to put you on a very um, hard course of antibiotics to, to get rid of this. So I thought, OK, fine. Didn't think any more about it. Carried on doing what it's doing. But in the meantime, between that time, yeah. we were just setting up our extraction plant for our Manuka honey. And because it was so full on and I wasn't getting to stop for lunch or anything, I was constantly eating honey to keep myself yeah. going. Three months later, back to the specialist. He has another look. Paul, I don't know what's going on, but there's no H. pylori. So I explained to him about the manuka, and he just looked at me almost like, whatever. Um, there's a study on that, Paul. Oh, okay, right. So at the same time, Dr. Molan had come out and said, this is what the stuff does. So on a number of occasions, and just recently again, because it will come back again, this H. pylori, um, I'd been in again for some, um, looking for, um, in, inside my stomach again with an endoscope and same issue. There was also some inflammation that had been happening. Um, and I can't remember the terminology they used, but it basically meant there was, it was an ulceration, but it was similar. And so same thing. Yeah. So I thought, right, I'm going to get serious about this again, because sometimes, you know, you do tend to slack off a bit on these things and I'm going to put myself on a really strict regime of Manuka honey. Yeah. And the turmeric. Yep. And I did that for three months. And when I went back to see the specialist, he looked at me confused. He said, look, he said, there's no H. pylori. Yeah. But the pathologist report come back saying that you must have H. pylori because the signs in your stomach show that you've had it, but we can't, but it's not there. So we don't know what's going on. I love this conversation because there's actually data now coming out to support what you're saying. And it's not like you're making this shit up. You know, no. um, there's actually data supporting it's used. H. pylori notoriously. Well, Cheryl's laughing at my use of the word shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are talking about the bowels, all right? We talk shit all the time. All right. All right. So the H. pylori is a bacterial infection in your gut, but notoriously, it just comes back over and over and over again. And people go on rounds and rounds of multiple antibiotics to get rid of it. And for me, it's it, what what's interesting about it is is that even though you're taking anytime any someone takes an antibiotic, they're killing not just the good back the the target bacteria, which is H. pylori, but you're also killing a bunch of good bacteria as well. So I'm not saying it's bad, but I'm saying that it's not a necessarily cure all. You can be actually creating some bacterial imbalances and problems with it. I did my research and I found that licorice capsules were very good for putting a lining on the stomach. Yes. I did the manuka and licorice, and it's licorice is in a form called DGL, which is deglycerated licorice. It's the part of the licorice plant that's incredibly sticky and slimy, so it's a good coder coder for your gut, which then also helps you absorb the manuka. So I, that's genius. Yeah. I love that use of the licorice. Yeah. Go on. And, Go and on. You couldn't you get, the problem was when he comes to do the um, the colonoscopy, you couldn't couldn't see the bowel part because of this lining of stuff, and you couldn't work out what it was, and you had to wash it off. <laughs> it was the licorice. <laughs> but anyway, um, so so I think what's important here is for, uh, to help people understand how this actually worked. So what I did is I took the licorice morning and night in a glass of warm water, um, just to dissolve the tablets and all the powder in the water. Um, and now with the manuka honey, what I found worked best was little and often of the highest activity you can buy. Because you don't want to be eating volumes of honey of the sugar content, like I say, you know, that you wouldn't be eating that tablespoon and you don't need to. So if you have a very strong active, you only need a very small amounts, but the frequency is a critical piece, so it stays in contact with the stomach as long as possible. 
Yeah. So I'm talking about having um, maybe half a teaspoon, um, quarter of a teaspoon every hour or two, um, just on, in the mouth, a bit of water, and doing that throughout the day. Then at night I'll do the same. If I wake up to go to the toilet, I take some. Whenever I'm, whenever I'm awake, I'd have some. And your gut will wake you up. And your gut will wake up if it's playing up. Mm -hmm. Take a bit of manuka, a bit of water, back to bed type of thing. And then in the morning, I'd have a tablespoon of honey on my breakfast, unheated, just straight on my breakfast every morning. For the general population, when they're consuming a honey, a manuka honey, and say, I want, I have autoimmune disease, or I have ulcerative colitis, I don't have an active infection in this time, then use honey as you would any sort of sweetener um, and, and get the antimicrobial activity. So like for me, I almost think about it as there's an everyday honey. There's an everyday honey that I use every day. If you were to look at Steen's line of honey, what, which one would you choose as an everyday honey and why? I think obviously there's two considerations, but um, any degree of manuka is going to give you a benefit. But I would probably, because of my situation, I wouldn't want to be eating less than a 10. Yep. A 10 UMF, which is about 250 MGO. Right. Um, yep. Um, and ten. Yeah, but then having said that, you know, if you were looking at it as just um, bulk use, we're using it for everything, and kids are using a lot and eating a lot, and, and it's a price point issue. Then going to a lower grade, you're still better off with this honey because of its rawness. Yeah. Than you are with the processed honey. Yep. Okay, so you might you, even if you use the lowest grade MGO honey that we have you're still better off because it's a raw product that yep. has all these other benefits that a highly processed honey has already lost long ago. And I think, and I think I'm carrying on from what Paul's saying, we don't process our, our lower active honeys any different to our higher active honeys. They're processed exactly the same. Yep. So everything, so the way we process in that, you know, keeping all the, the bee bread and the all those antimicrobials and everything is, are in, in our entire range. It's not just, we don't just keep those special for the, you know, okay. for the higher ones. Yeah. So tell me if I'm, I got, this is how I use it. Okay. Since I discovered you guys and tracked you guys down, this is how I use it. Okay. I'm this, I'm the Steam's Manuka Honey Stalker here. Um, <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> I, I use the 10 as my everyday honey. So yeah. I will use it. Um, in my warm water, in my tea, and in my coffee. This is what I'll use. If I'm actively fighting an infection, I'm going to use a 20 orally. Yeah. And I will use it like a quarter to half a teaspoon multiple times during the day as an adjunct to other ways of trying to kill or deal with an infection. If I am using it topically, you definitely want to go 20 or above. You have your 24 gold. And I use the 24 for skin and, and wound healing. Um, would you say that's a pretty good way of using the different UMFs for like the, the best honey for each kind of use? Is that a reasonable approach? Although if I if I if I went to the doctor and found out that I had H pylori, I would be I'd be starting off with the twenty four. I'd You'll be start with right there, yeah. yeah. And yeah. if it's not a price point issue, I absolutely agree with you. I would go with twenty four yeah. as well. And um, it's like people said to me, oh, you know, but it's it's so expensive, and it is you know, the 24 plus, but you know, what is multiple trips to the doctor, multiple trips to the pharmacy, multiple trips to, to medications and, you know, and I, and I think, you know, if, sorry, you were going to say, oh, oh, and I think, I thought he was going to argue with me. <laughs> Well, no, because here's what Paul's saying is true, which is this. I see yeah. people with H. pylori the fifth time, the sixth time, and each time, each round of these antibiotics is like three to $600 and like weeks of your life and then the pain and suffering and higher risk of cancer with it. So it's like, and, and the doses of antibiotics that have, that have killed off all the good gut flora and, and bowel flora and everything else. So, you know, you, you're doing something much better for your body in the long term than, yeah. than going through a, down the, down the traditional track. When you even buy regular honey, and I have bought other brands of Manuka honey, it is not the same experience whatsoever, which is why for me, I, I hounded you guys down and was like, let's educate the public about what it's what it really is what is real manuka and i call real as in real results the kind of honey that you're going to get the results yeah. Yeah. It's not that yeah. work yeah. Yeah. right yeah. Absolutely. yeah we're not interested in just one chemical ingredient in a, in a product which is mgo you know we're interested in the whole honey 
So I'm going to tell people how to track you down. So first thing first is um, steenshoney.com is going across the bottom of the screen. That's the best. Um, that's You can get steenshoney.com. Uh, and there's a code here that you guys are going to be offering. If you use the code that you see on the screen, which is Dr. Maggie 20 uh, you're going to get 20% of all your purchases. Um, so go ahead and, and just um, that's how you can get a hold of um, check it out. The other thing is on Instagram, uh, you can follow um Paul and Cheryl and Steen's Honey at Steen's Manuka Honey. And then you can follow me at MaggieU.MD as well. So this is these are different ways in which you can find us. If you've enjoyed this interview, I would love for you guys to, if you're on YouTube, give us a thumbs up, ring the bell so you get notified when we have uh, new videos and live videos. Uh, if you are on our Facebook page, uh, please click a like. And if there's someone you know that could benefit from this information, can you put their name in their comment section? Because sharing is caring. And they may not listen to you or you, but they may listen to me or they may listen to Paul or Cheryl. So so sharing is caring and it <laughs> listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> but they listen to him. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. If you guys could give um Paul and Cheryl uh some thumbs up, some hearts, some likes right now, that'd be awesome. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs>